two red ones at the back, so in case the front, you can remove your mask when you're doing that. Yes, good. Good morning and welcome to worship. As we come together this morning, we are here to draw near to God, our second Sunday of Advent. And as we light the candle, let me read to you some verses from Isaiah chapter 9. The prophet says, Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun the land of Naphtali, but in the future he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light, and those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. Give thanks to God. We've lit our candles and we're going to sing, Lord, the light of your love is shining, in the midst of the darkness shining. Let us join together in giving thanks to God. I know we're not able to, to, um, to sing, but please stand in your place. It's good to see you in the sanctuary this morning. And as we worship God together, I hope that this will be the start of something great. That as we get closer and closer, um, towards the new year that more and more of us will be able to meet together. Lord, the light of your love is shining. Please stand as we sing. Truth, the truth, the 
There's a, a song that says, Jesus bids us shine with a clear, pure light. Like a little candle burning in the night. And so, as we've come this morning, it's such a difference to have you here in the sanctuary and to be together again. And where God's people are met together, there he is in the midst of us. And wherever you are joining us from this morning, know that God is with you. And God is able. All you have to do is just to reach out, and God will connect with you. Let's come to him in prayer. Whenever we come to God in prayer, bring your praise and your thanksgiving to him. And then draw close. You are God, holy and righteous. And Lord, we count it a privilege to be able to gather in this way with the assurance that you are here in our midst. In fact, we know that from the moment we have said yes to your gift, your of salvation, you will never ever leave us, but you're always with us. But in a very special way when we come together, here you are. Here you are in our midst. And so this morning as we draw near to you, we come with thanksgiving in our hearts and praise on our lips. For all that you have done and continues to do, we praise your name and we thank you. And Lord, as we come again, being able to draw together in this way, Lord, we pray that wherever the church is gathered this morning, we pray that your name will be glorified. We pray you will do something special among your people. We pray that you, your Holy Spirit, that you have left with us. Holy Spirit, move among us. Bring healing. Bring wholeness. And let there be joy among your people, Lord. We come, Lord, and we bring our community to you. And we pray, Lord, that you would minister to each one. Father, we don't need to tell you of the challenges that we face from day to day. But Lord, we just ask that you would help us. You have seen the challenge as a, we have been through in terms of the bereavements that so many of our brothers and sisters are going through. But Lord, I want to thank you that you have been there, helping and enabling. You know the trouble that are in our community and within our areas and the things that have happened in recent times. And Lord, we bring all those involved before you this morning. But we ask, Lord, that as we are in your temple, as, rather, as we are together and you are in us because we are your temple, that, Lord, that we, your, the fire of your spirit will move among us and consume any doubts that are within us, Lord. And open our eyes to your majesty and help us to draw near and bow before you as we worship you. Father, for those who have come with ailments, I ask in the name of Jesus that right now you'll bring healing. Receive the healing that comes from your God. Receive it in faith. Jesus. Think not of how you're feeling, but receive the healing that God has for you this morning. For those in their homes, I pray that you will receive the healing that you need to rise up and go forth again. And so we thank you, Lord. We thank you that you're a faithful God. So hear our prayers. And Lord, as we gather around the communion table this morning that reminds us of your great sacrifice, the depth of your love, we pray again you will refresh us. Lord, we pray that today will be like no other day, but it'll be a special day as we worship you together. All these things we ask for your kingdom and your glory's sake. Amen. Let's say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us and help us not to fall into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom the power and the glory forever and ever amen bless the lord bless the lord says oh my soul and all that is within me bless his holy name bless his holy name yvonne is going to come and, and lead us in a song as we say 
good morning to each other. We're not able to say good morning in the way that we normally do, but we're going to just say good morning as, and acknowledge one another. Good morning all. Good morning. So nice to be with you once again. I was here last week and I was really blessed. Um, so I'm here with you again this week and I pray that we can worship together in the beauty of holiness. We're just going to bless the Lord. Oh my son, all that is with me, we're going to bless his holy name. If you're able to stand, please stand with me as we worship together in Jesus' name. <laughs> together in the presence of the Lord to give thanks and to just to enjoy his presence. Allow faith to arise within you and receive what the Lord has for you this morning. Good morning church. The reading this morning is from John 3 chapter 14 to 18. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the forest, in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believed in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believed in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world 
through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Here ends the lesson. Thank you. There will be an opportunity um, to share a word of testimony before we, we spend some time in worship. So, if God has been particularly good to you in the past few weeks, months, and you want to share something of that, then I want to give you that opportunity, if you'd like to do that. Let's listen to the notices for the coming week. Good morning. Good morning. You know, the psalmist David said, I rejoiced with those who said to me, let's go to the house of God. Isn't it wonderful, friends, to be in the house of God this morning? Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. I'm so filled with joy. I don't even know if I can speak. So today, rejoice. Rejoice with me as once again we're back in the house of God, giving him worship and praise. Lord, we say glory to you. I welcome you. Welcome you in the house of our Lord, in the house of the Almighty God. It has, he, he has been with us and he has helped us and he has provided for us and he will continue to provide. He provides all our needs. So good morning and a pleasant city road welcome to you and thank you for joining us wherever you're joining us from. We bid you welcome. It is wonderful having you participating in our, in our fellowship at City Road Baptist Church, and we thank you for choosing to worship with us today. There are blessings upon blessings upon blessings when people of God come together, because the Bible says, wherever two or three are gathered in his midst, there he is to bless us. So we claim that blessing today. Is, have we got any, anyone visiting for the very first time? No. If anyone is watching us for the first time out on the, in, in the internet, we welcome you and we just say thank you for being with us. We have done the acknowledgement, so I'll just say, say you know, just, just say good morning. Housekeeping. Thank you again, as we remind you to observe the one-way system. You know, sometimes we haven't been doing it, so it may get out of our mind. So we continue to observe the one-way system throughout the building and social distancing. Remember also, as we've been asking, that when you come into the sanctuary, the seat that you have chosen, you stay with that seat throughout and not keep changing seat, and we thank you for that. Mobile phones, if you haven't done so already, can I ask you please to put them on silence? And the fire alarms, should that go, you'll be directed out of the building through this, by the safest exit by, um, with our stewards. Toilets are out the door on your left, my right, and that's for housekeeping. We'd like to welcome Pastor Gordon again. Thank you, Pastor, for keeping us fed throughout the time. And if you know it has been difficult speaking to enter chairs, but you weren't actually speaking to enter chairs. We were all listening. So bless you. Thank you. Our, our musicians, we give you thanks again for the work that you do for God. And we would like to welcome um, Yvonne, who is here worshiping with us. And we don't know how long she's going to be here, but while she's here, we know God is going to bless her, and we thank you for coming to um, share with us, Yvonne. So welcome again <clears throat> this morning. As you can see, the table is spread for a celebration. We're going to celebrate communion, and hope you come, and whoever wish, you may be able to participate. Today is the second Sunday of Advent, and we see we've got our candles lit. It's also the very first Sunday of the month, and later on we'll go on and greet and welcome those who've had birthdays or anniversaries or whatever you're celebrating this month. We'll do that afterwards. So our weekly activities. <clears throat> We're still only meeting on a Sunday morning here. Pastor Gordon will be available throughout the week except on a Thursday. Thursday is his day off, which sometimes it doesn't take, but it is day off. But throughout the week he's available. You can co contact him via telephone. Tomorrow, Monday the 7th, we have a day of fasting or regular day of fasting. And I would encourage you again, church, that although we're not 
together in the church, you spend some time, if you can, in fasting and just seeking the Lord and, and what, he, what he wants for us and what he wants for your life. And that is from 11 a.m. until 3 p.m. We'll have a deacons meeting at 7 p.m. in the evening. So deacons, um, we'll be meeting via Zoom and we'll take it from there. On Tuesday evening, we continue with our home groups which is led by myself, and that's via Zoom. And we're looking in the fabulous book of Daniel, absolutely fabulous book of Daniel. So um, I'll send out the details of which, we're, I know we're in chapter two, chapter two, right? On Wednesday, we continue with Pastor Gordon um, Bible study, and that's at 7 p.m. via Zoom, and we're looking into Luke, we're still looking into Luke chapter one, Luke chapter one. Right, um, so next Sunday we're back here in the building. Next Sunday the 13th, we're back here to worship God. But before our worship service at 11, we have a 10.30 prayer meeting. And we have a prayer meeting at 10, around 10.30, 10, 20, 10 on a Sunday morning before worship service starts. For the days of our diary, um, on Sunday the 20th, there will be a baptism here. There will be a baptism here on Sunday the 20th. Um, the rest of the Christmas organization celebration you'll hear later on. Um, right, I'm going to put a request out. I'm asking for help, for volunteers. We need people to read the, the, the passages of scripture on a Sunday morning, and we just need some help with um, helping with the meet and greet on a Sunday morning. So if you feel you're able to, please, please come and speak to me after church. I'd like to make a rota for maybe three to six months because we're not sure how things are going right now, but we're gonna step out in faith and we're gonna make a rota for three to six months and I'd value your support in this, um, the, the reading the, the, the scriptures and um, peeing on the doors. Just to remind you, the offering box is just outside as you go. At the end of service, you can put your offering in there and we still maintain our social distancing. And the thought for the week, I think it's from Mark chapter 6, verse 10. I didn't write the reference down. And it says, Jesus looked at them and said, With man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. All things are possible with God. So it doesn't matter what we're going through. Mm -hmm. We know that all God is possible. And he hasn't lost a battle yet. And he will not lose your battle. So thank you for listening. Have yourself a great week and a blessed day. God bless you all. Thank you, Leslie. Let's just give thanks to God for his goodness and his grace and his provision. Father, we thank you that you are a providing God. We thank you for the many blessings you have poured into our lives. We ask now that as we continue to celebrate that you'll receive our thanksgiving for the offerings that we have brought to you in the past and will bring in the future. We thank you for the resources you have given to us, for the measure of help that you have blessed us with, and with all the opportunities, we thank you. And so we offer to you, Lord, our praise and our thanksgiving for all your interaction in our lives. For your glory's sake. Amen. Before we listen to uh, Millie bring uh, a testimony, um, uh, have we any, any, any birthdays? Any birthdays this month? My grandson is number eight. Number eight. Um, I, I didn't ask you beforehand, um, Yvonne, but I wonder whether you could come and sing happy birthday for, for these folks. Um, any, any more, just have any more birthdays? One, and one over there, yes, coming this month. It's a very special month, okay? Great. Any anniversaries this month? All right. Well, we're going to sing happy birthday to you and may God bless you. And if you have a birthday, if you're joining us and you have a birthday, whatever the birthday is, we wish you a very blessed day. We're going to sing happy birthday, or rather, Yvonne is going to sing happy birthday for you. <laughs> happy birthday to you. Happy
Okay, Millie want to come and share something of what God has done for her. Good morning, church. I seemed so keen, didn't I? I kept getting up and coming. <laughs> It's so good to be back in the house of the Lord. It really is. Um, I just want to give him thanks and praise for his everlasting love, for his grace, for his mercy, because I know that I received all of those. I've been away from here since September because I had surgery on one of my eyes. And I've heard so many wonderful things about the surgery and how it heals well and all of this. And so I was expecting that for myself. But unfortunately, um, it hasn't gone the way that I wanted it to go. I mean, it's taken so long to heal. I um, mean, it's like one thing after, after the other, right? And um, different things happening to, each time we go for a check, they find something that needs more treatment. And um, it's a long time now. I mean, it's like three months almost, and that's kind of worrying. Um, they seem to be okay with it, but there's one thing you shouldn't really do, you shouldn't really go on the internet and read things about this thing because you get the worst possible scenario. But anyway, I put everything, I put my trust in God and I leave everything to him. And I'm confident that it's going to heal. I just know God knows best. And I know it's just a matter of time before I go back and the, 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 the nurse or the doctor would say, oh, fantastic, you know, it's healed because I, I just know it well. Um, but because I've had so many anxieties throughout these past few months, um, I was quite surprised when I sort of, I can't remember if I woke up or what I was doing, but I noticed a shadow in my good eye, which I, I mean, I, I called it my bad eye, and it was my good eye. And I just saw something moving about. I thought perhaps it was dangling from my hair or something. I was kept on doing that. Then I realized that this shadow was coming from my right eye, which wasn't the eye that was operated on. So I thought, my goodness, what is this? I thought, I thought, well, Lord of mercy, what's this? Because I called out to God straight away, Lord of mercy, what's going on? So I rang, I thought perhaps it was coming from my the eye that was operated on, and somehow it's a shadow. And when I explained what was happening, they said, it, it isn't that, it's got to be my right eye. And I thought, wow, that's concerning as well. Two eyes at the same time, that's not very good. Um, so I went to the emergency room and they found that there's a slight retina detachment in my right eye. So I started to pray and I started to say, you know, we take our eyes for granted all the time. We don't expect anything to happen to them. And when they do, you realize how important they are to us because you can go without your, your hearing or, your, or the senses, but, you know, I don't know how I'd be here if, if you know, I'd have to be led by somebody and... You know, it is scary. And no matter how much you place your faith in God, I think your anxieties come on as initially. Um, and I don't think there's anything wrong with anxieties or worry, but it's how long you allow them to dwell. So I didn't think of the anxiety as, oh no, you shouldn't do that, or you shouldn't do that. Um, but there isn't anything they can do because it isn't class considered to be bad. You know, it's, you know, at the moment I can see from both my eyes, even though I'm having issues with both of them, I can see clearly I haven't lost any vision or anything like that. Um, so I'm putting my trust in God. And, you know, I was reading my Bible, you know, from time to time I do. And I was reading um, Proverbs, I think it was Proverbs 12. And I, when I got down to chapter 25, I think it says, anxieties, um, weighs heavily on the heart and I thought and I know it isn't exactly the heavy on the heart but I was interpreting myself um, I could be causing additional issues and sort of concerns by being overly anxious so anxiety weighs heavily on the heart but encouraging words and prayer does make a major difference and I want to say a big thank you to my church family as well because throughout the Dove group um, we, where we communicate um, I have had so much prayer and so much good wishes and so much wonderful words. That's really made a difference to how I feel. So I thank God. I give God thanks for all of that. And I know I'm sort of going on a bit, but there's so much that's happened, but I just need to share it, you know, because it makes 
it is, makes you feel lighter. Um, in addition to that, my grandson was very, very poorly. And again, I reached out to my Lord and Savior. I reached out to my family, my friends. And I've had so much prayer and so much good wishes. And he's fantastic. He's jumping around like a little 11-month-old boy. And I just give God thanks and praise. Another thing that's happened again, it's like one thing after another, but I try to let the anxieties take over because I know what I've read and I know what it says in the Bible. But my husband's brother was suffering from um, prostate cancer in Jamaica for some time. So he was in and out of hospital. And because of COVID, um, nobody could visit they could, you know, they could visit and stand by the door and hand things, but pass through him or stuff like that. So, on one occasion, um, the family who was who normally goes to visit him couldn't make it. Um, I think for a week. And when she turned, and they, the, the hospital do have numbers, you know, family family members phone numbers because they've called before to say he's ready to come out of hospital, etc. But on this occasion, the family member went to visit him. And he was, and he, you know, she was told that he had passed away, and they had placed him in a morgue somewhere. And can you imagine the distress mm -hmm. that has caused to a family member? Mm -hmm. It was unthinkable, and it was so sad. It was really, really sad. And he was placed in a morgue. And when we went to check, how long he's been there? He's been there for a week. <laughs> this is so, you know, inhumane and. You just gotta, you just gotta pray to God and just get your senses back and just, otherwise you could get really angry, you know, because it, it's very, very distressing. But he was laid to rest um, last week, and I've got to give God thanks because all of the instructions, because we couldn't be there at all. My husband couldn't be there, and his family of twelve couldn't be there, and um, so we gave instructions and financial. Um, and everything went fantastically. So I've got to give God thanks and praise and I've got to say what a mighty God we serve. I trust and I believe in him. And I've also read on the dove, on, on one of the morning, um, morning tea, um, that when so many things happen to you and you don't know, you can't understand where it's coming from or what to do, just place it in a box and say, here you are, Lord. I give it to you and I put all my trust in you and you can just feed back to me mm. and I see all the signs and I listen out for him and I hear when he speaks. Mm. So thank you Jesus and thank you friends and thank you church family. Bless you. God bless you. Thank you. Amen, amen, amen. What a testimony. Isn't God good? Yes. Hasn't he kept us through danger seen and unseen? Amen. amen. Yet we can still give him praise. Why? Because he is God. He'll never leave us or never forsake us. So be encouraged that he is with you to the end of the age. Amen. So we're going to have a time of worship now. Why? Because this is the day that the Lord has made. And we will rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Amen. If you can, stand with me as we sing these songs in Jesus' name.
Esther because she's been so good. If you ever knew where the Lord has taken me from to this point, my God, my soul cries out, hallelujah. So we will think how great is our God. Sing with me how great, how great is our God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. The splendor of the King.
praise you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Michael is going to come and lead us in the time of prayer. Michael, come with us. How great is our God? Let's come with this knowledge that there's nothing that God cannot do. Let's join as Michael lead us in prayer. Bless the Lord. All right, good morning, good morning. How great is our God? How great is his name? How wonderful, how wonderful, how glorious. Father, as we come to God before prayer, just above our, above our heads, mm. right, let's bring our loved ones, let's bring our family. Yes, Lord. Let's bring those people that can't be with us today. Yes, Lord. Those people that's at home. Yes, Lord. Let's think about the uh, bereaved as well, because yes, we have Lord. members of the, the sort of congregations who mm. have bereavements. Thank you, Lord. And Father, we thank you for Millie. We thank you for her wonderful testimony. Yes, Lord. We thank you for the praises, mm. the praises that went up this morning. Mm. We thank you that the reading says, for God so loved the world thank that you, he Lord. gave his only son. Mm. He loves us all. He loves thank us you. as we are. Thank you, Lord. We don't love ourselves as much as God loves us, mm. but he loves us he knows everything about us. And he's given us his spirit. Yes, he's given us his spirit. Thank you. Thank you, God, for your spirit. Mm. Thank you, God, for being God, for being who you are. Yes, Lord. You're our father. You're our deliverer. You're mm. our healer. Thank you, you're Lord. our friend. Mm. Father, we love you. Thank you, Lord. Father, we join with the other people we have families all over the world, mm. in the Caribbean, in the US, in Africa, in every continent, of, right, we're linked. We're linked by blood, by descent, we're also linked because you all created all of us and we all belong to you. So Father, we bring to you all the, 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 uh, the problems which have been experienced in different parts of the world, yes. in this country. Health or finance or political, or or Brexit or coronavirus. Father, we all give them over to you as well. Give everything over to you. Yes. So, Father, as we continue in this worship, mm. be close to us, help us, nurture us, and continue to bless us. Yes. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Bless his holy name. Truly he is our saviour. Mm -hmm. And the greatest gift he has given us is his son, Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And as we come before him, I just want us to be mindful that he sees, he knows, and he cares. Mm -hmm. All we have to do is surrender all. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. We have to be the light that shines in the darkness today. For someone to know and come to know him as Lord and saviour. Amen. So as we go along our daily business, help us to have the light of Christ within us. Mm -hmm and surrender all to him. Amen.
Glory be to God. Oh, hallelujah. The ability to surrender is based upon one feeling completely confident and at ease with the one you will surrender to. God is a God of love and a God of grace who draws us to himself and calls us to follow after him. And he has our good at heart. The passage that Judith read to us, John 3 verse 14 through to 18, I want to explore with you this morning. Salvation, God's gift to all. One of my earliest memory of my mother, I must have been, what, two years old? I remember her singing, there is no satisfaction without salvation. I didn't know what it mean, it was just a song to me, but retrospectively, after coming to faith, I have a keen understanding of what that really means. All I want for Christmas is you. That is the title of a Christmas song by Mariah Carey. What is it you want for Christmas? Huh? I'm sure that you've been thinking about the gifts that you are going to purchase for those you love. But what do you want for Christmas? You know, we live in a consumer society that somehow we feel that we need all these things to make us happy. Let me ask you the question, have you ever received a gift and thought, this is almost what I wanted? Huh? Have you ever had that? You received a gift and you thought, this is almost what I wanted. Or maybe you thought, what were they thinking? <laughs> or I know where this gift comes from. It's the gift they had received and they didn't want it anymore, so they passed it on to me. We don't always verbalize these things. You know, parents, being a parent and um, being a child as well, I can see both sides. As children, the things you want are not always the things that your parents get you. Because they're coming to it from a very practical perspective. But you know, God in his grace and his mercy, he knows exactly what we need. And he comes to it not only from a practical perspective, but he comes to it from an enjoyment perspective. Because let me say to you, before coming to faith, you know, I thought that being a Christian was a very miserable thing. And sometimes, some of us who say we do know Christ still behave as though it's a miserable experience. We need to allow the joy of God to live within us. You see, when God gave us his Christmas present in the form of his son, our Lord Jesus Christ, without question, without any question, he gave us a greater gift than we could ever imagine. Have you ever been wowed by a gift? I think, wow. Is this for me? Really? And it's been a greater gift and so many different fronts. And so I want you to think about the gifts that you will give, but above all, what it is that you really need in your life. What is it that you really need in your life? You see, God saw that real need of mankind, and he sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to bring healing and well-being to a sick and dying world. When one is sick, you know, the only thing that matters is healing. Nothing else matters. When you are feeling unwell, all the shine goes off all those things that once drew your attention and attracted you and kept you. All you want is to get better. And our world is very sick. And our world needs healing. The present help and well-being of our world, the whole world, is very, 
very fragile. I need not tell you because some of you have experienced it in so many different ways and forms. And one of the things that what's going on has done is to, in fact, is to create a fear within people. A fear to do anything or to go anywhere or to reach out. Why? Because they don't know what the future holds or what's out there. We need to find a cure for the present ills. And thank God there are many, many vaccines that are on the horizons. And there are people whose hope are being raised. And there are still those who don't believe that this vaccine is going to work. And there are still those who believe that there is no virus. But let me say to you, my brothers and sisters, God is in the midst of us. And we need to open our eyes and our hearts. So that not only will we see, but we will understand and begin to respond and to do what God requires of us. The reading that we, we looked at began by telling us that as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Now, there's an issue here that we are dealing with that is, is so important. And we need to go back to thinking about that story of Moses in the wilderness and what actually happened there. So if you have your Bibles with, with you, let's think around this. Why did Moses have to lift up a serpent in the wilderness? Well, the story of the Israelites' journey out of Egypt, God's plan for them was to take them into the promised land. But when Moses sent out the spies to look at the land, the majority of them came back and said, wow, it's a beautiful place. But there are some giants there. There's absolutely no way we can take this land. Joshua, however, said we can. But the majority said no. And as a result, discouragement entered the camp. And what was meant for a short journey to begin to possess what God intended ended up spending 40 years in the wilderness going round and round and round and round. And after the spies had returned and they started to, to wander around, one of the things that happened, they started to complain about they didn't like the food that they were having or the lack of food, and they thought we were okay in Egypt on the one hand. And they started to complain against God and against Moses, his leader, his chosen leader. Let me say to you, friends, the moment you enter into that arena of complaining against God, or God's leaders, you're on dangerous ground. Very dangerous ground. It's important to recognize that. God will stand many, many things, but the moment you start to complain against God, you're on dangerous ground. As a result of that, it says God sent a plague of snakes among them. And the snakes began to attack them. This is in Numbers 21. Um, you know, you can read through that story. And the snakes began to attack them. And many died. And all of a sudden, they came to their realization that this has happened as a direct result of us complaining against God and against Moses. And they recognized their mistake. And they repented and they go and they spoke to Moses. And they asked Moses to pray for them. Now, God is such a gracious God. Whenever you fail God and he identifies your failure and you come back and you ask for forgiveness, God is willing to forgive. But I want you to follow the story because in the story, when, God, when Moses prayed to God, God said to Moses, I want you to build a brass serpent. I want you to create a, um, a serpent out of brass and elevate it, make it so it stands up. And now anyone who is bitten by a snake, if they look at that brass snake, they will be healed. It's laughable, isn't it? Yes, we know that there are people who worship idols, and they're, you know, they were very aware of people who worship idols, and you say, now how does this fit into the scheme of things? You know, in the story, uh, we go back to the fall of man. It is said that it was a snake who tempted the, the woman, vice versa. And now God has used the same symbol to inflict punishment upon his people there. 
But also, the very thing that was punishing them, he brought and is a symbol. The difference was that the snakes, the, the living one, had venom. But this one had no venom at all. But it wasn't the snake that brought healing to them. It wasn't that, you know, that form of the snake. You know what it was that brought healing to them? It was their obedient response to the word of God, to God's command. It was God who brought healing as they obey what he asked of them. Sometimes God asks us to do things and we enter into negotiation or rather rationalization. Well, God, how is that going to work? And we end up not responding in obedience and we miss what God wanted to bring to us. We miss what God wanted to bring to us. The healing that comes wasn't from the snake, but their faithful, obedient response, believing that God would heal them when they look at the bronze snake, believing that God would do what he says he would do. You remember when, when Jesus said to, to Peter, come on, Peter, come on out. You don't walk on water. If Peter had stopped the Russian lines about that, he would not have had that experience. And it is recorded that all those who were bitten by snakes and looked to the bronze were healed. Now we know in our present time that there are a lot of venomous snakes. And lots of portions, rather, vaccines have to be made to counteract. And how important it is to get that vaccine almost immediately into a person when they're bitten by a snake. But God in his grace and his mercy says, look, by looking in obedience, he brought healing to those people. But there is a, symbol, a similarity or a parallel with Jesus Christ, you see. And isn't it interesting that there are people who are still thinking it is laughable to think that a man who was born so many years ago who was crucified can still bring healing to my life. The elevation of the serpent they, that he was, it was seen and when they were bitten they, they looked to it and experience healing. We have been bitten by sin. And our only healing comes from God through Jesus Christ. It is Jesus Christ who brings that healing to us. He is God's remedy for man's sin and separation. Jesus Christ is God's remedy for a sick and dying world. He offers salvation to all, all who will believe in him. Isn't that wonderful? Salvation to all who will believe in him. Now, we can kid ourselves. You're here this morning and you have come on a regular basis and you're listening from your homes and you're listening to the words, whatever your, your take on it is. But it's not so much the words that are spoken that will, it is about your response to the word and believing God, what he says. The living word of God, when we apply faith, something happens. Something happens in our lives. What a gift. What a gift. Free but not cheap. Free but not cheap. Priceless. God's gift to mankind is priceless. Do you know why? It doesn't matter how much money you have. You cannot buy it. It's not for sale. It is not for sale. It doesn't matter how poor you are, you can access it because it's a gift. And if you will receive the gift of God and to implement the gift of God within your life, you'll begin to experience the power of the gift of God. Because when you have been stung by, by a snake, and in the present moment, if you've been affected by the, the coronavirus, and if you want to protect yourself against these things, you have to accept the remedy or else you put yourself in danger. God paid dearly with the life of his son. The highest price he could pay, the life of his son. Why? Because he loves us so much. When you love someone, nothing is too much. It causes you to make sacrifices. And even sometimes when you know, you know, have you ever experienced or, or observed the relationship of a mother to their children? And the things they will do for their children? 
And if we being human are prepared to do such things, to put ourselves out, to help our children, what will God not do for us? What will he not do? Jesus accepted our punishment. The punishment of separation. And what it means. Those who have had the virus knows that you know, they talk about long COVID. Being separated from God, we have entered into a period where we are being diminished and are moved away from the center of what we were created to be. And God wants to bring us back so we may begin to live and to experience the joy of living. My sisters, my brothers, he paid the price for our sins. You don't have to worry about it. And then you know what he did? He offered us the new life he had bought for us. He offered us the new life he's bought for us. There's a program on television where people bring um, things that are, you know, me has meaning and significance to them. And they have them repaired and, uh, you know, these guys repair them. And, and then when they return to receive it and they can see the difference, that they're just so overwhelmed. I want to say to you this morning, if you will bring your life to Christ. He's not even going to renovate it, you know. You know what he's going to do? He's going to give you a new life. A new life. A life that cannot even be recognized. It's going to be new. Completely new. God's love is not static or self-centered. Wherever you are, there's no way you can go where God's love cannot reach you. There is nothing that you can do that causes God to stop loving you. Remember that. He loves you with an everlasting love and he has paid the ultimate price for you and he's purchased your salvation and he wants to give it to you. He wants to give it to you. When you love someone, you are basically you are willing to give freely to the point of self-sacrifice. God set the pattern for love for all relationships. When there are true deep relationships, there's a willingness to give completely and wholly. Not only is the gift of God priceless, it is also eternal. Eternal. You know, it doesn't matter what we have, it wears out. One point or other, even your body wears out. You know, <laughs> you know I was, I was uh, watching a program the other day and I speak of a man and, and spoke of his age. And I thought, I'm older than that man. Do I look that old? <laughs> Somehow I feel as though I'm just as young as when I was a boy. But we are getting older. And we need to recognize that reality. But that which God gives to us is eternal. You know, some people are repulsed by the idea of eternal life. You know why? So they should, in one sense. Because their lives are miserable. And who want to live in eternal misery? Some people are just longing to escape from the life that they have. And so the idea of eternal life is a continuation of misery. But let me tell you, the eternal life that Jesus promised says God so loved that he gave that whoever believed received eternal life. The eternal life is not an extension of a person's miserable mortal life. No. Eternal life is God's life embodied in Christ. And when you receive the word of God and receive and accept Christ into your life, it is that which he gives to all believers now as a guarantee that they will live forever. Let me read a couple of verses to you from Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13 and 14 tells us that, And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, when you believed, you were marked with him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. Marked with that seal, the promised Holy Spirit, he says, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until he comes. You have been marked with God's Holy Spirit as God. And the life that he gives begins here and now. And it grows and it expands and you begin to see and to understand things from a new perspective. Receive this new life, my friends, by faith. 
and begin then to evaluate your life. It is so important, you know, for us to live reflective lives, meaning evaluating our lives, our actions, our responses, and see why we are behaving the way we are, and to ask ourselves the question, is this how I want to continue to live my life? And to see the, to see the trajectory that if we continue along this path, we're going to end up there. By God's grace, you can take a stand and you can change and you can say, I'm going to move forward in the name of Jesus. To believe is more than just an intellectual agreement about something. We need to accept that Jesus is God's gift of salvation to all. And though we may not be able to process the whole idea of how this means, because it seems so simple to say just to believe, to accept, is too easy. That's the way God has chosen. But when you come, he requires you to journey with him. It requires us to put our trust and our confidence in him that he alone can save us. Children are amazingly wonderful and frank. And they just tell you how it is. But if you have a good bond with a child and you place them on the table and you say jump and you reach your hand out, they're going to jump. They're not going to ask whether you can, because they know you love them and you're not going to let them down. You're going to catch them. So if you can trust God with that kind of confidence and say, Lord, I will follow you where you lead me, then my brothers, my sisters, you will know the power of a new life. If you receive the gift and unwrap it, and apply it to your life. We've been married now for 40 years. And there's a gift that we receive at our wedding presents, and it's still in the garage, still wrapped up. We haven't used it, not even once. I don't, I don't know where it will still work. But it is there. It is there. It is there. It requires us to put our trust and our confidence in God. In Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, you know what it says? There is no other name given under heaven whereby we must be saved but the name of Jesus. No other name. No other name. The wonderful gift. Christmas is about Christ Mass. About his birth and his coming among us to make it possible. And as I conclude this morning, I want to speak of one other, other aspect. Not only is it priceless, and eternal, it is also practical. There are lots of us who are very practical, and we need to know how it works. God bless our brother Jim. I used to love to have conversation with him because he says, How does this work? He wanted to know how it works. God's gift is very practical. You know, there are people who protect themselves from their fears by putting their faith in something they do or, or something they have. It is tangible. I know. Things like Good deeds. There are lots of people who do lots of good deeds. And, and they, are, they will do anything. But we're not talking about good deeds. Of course, that's great. There are those who have lots and lots of money in our possessions. And they put their confidence in these things. Well, you know, I can, anything I want, anything I need, I don't need to look to the right or to the left. I can have whatever I want, but you cannot purchase health. You cannot purchase life. There are those who are very, very skillful and are very, very intelligent. And they think, well, I can rationalize and I know these things up and you're kidding yourselves. I am contained. I'm self-contained. I'm my own God, as it were. Where are they now? Where are they? Where will you be in 10, 20, 30 years? And where will your possessions be? We're encouraged to store up treasures in heaven. By our reaction and response to the word of God. Only God can save us from the one thing we need to fear. And the one thing we need to fear is eternal condemnation. Jesus said, okay, don't worry about those who can just kill the body. But be concerned about the one who can not only kill the body, but cast the soul into hell. Now, whether you believe it or not, it's not for me to enter in, into a debate with you about it. I didn't say it. That's what he said. And I believe it. But even if it wasn't true and you protect yourself against these things by doing what he asks, what have you got to lose? Nothing. Faith, therefore, in God is recognizing the insufficiency of our efforts to find salvation and also by asking him to do his work in us. You see, it's practical to say, now, well, you know, if you go into the shop, isn't it amazing? If you go to the shop and you don't have enough money, 
If you're even a penny short, if the person don't know you, then sorry. And you think, really? I just need... No, sorry, you haven't got enough. And it doesn't matter how much you have, it's not enough to buy salvation. It's not enough. But if you come with open heart and receive what God gives, then not only will you be saved, I conclude then with these thoughts this morning. When Jesus speaks of unbelievers, he speaks of those who have basically ignored him or rejected him completely after looking and thinking or can't even be bothered to think. It isn't about those who have momentary doubts. We all have momentary doubts. It's about that. No. So as, let me say to you, sometimes we get caught up in a sense, in the festivities that we miss the truth of Christmas. This Christmas, make a decision that you're not going to allow the festivities or the tinsels to blind your eyes, but you're going to recognize the Christ in the midst, and not only are you going to glorify him and to acknowledge that you have him already, you have the greatest treasure. The greatest treasure, you have it already. And you didn't purchase it, but you received it from a loving God. And you can share it with others. Share it with others. Ask God to open your eyes then so that you can look beyond the immediate and see the real gift and share that gift. Salvation is God's gift to all mankind. Not to be kept and hidden, but to be shared for his glory and his kingdom's sake. Amen. This morning, if you've heard the word and you've not yet taken that step to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe today is your day. And remember, today is all you have. There is no guarantee of later on, in the evening or tomorrow. Today, right now, is what you have. I'm not seeking to bully you because, you know, coming to Jesus Christ is the most important thing you can do in your life. And don't come because someone tells you to come. Come because you've heard the call of God and recognize your need. And ask him to be your Lord and your Savior. Let us pray before we sing our hymn to gather around the communion table. Lord, thank you for your gift. You saw our need and that all that we could do was insufficient to bring us closer to you. So you came to us in the form of your son, you paid the penalty for our separation, our sin, and our failure. And Lord, you offered us this wonderful gift. Help us to receive it and to welcome you into our lives. So if you want to do that this morning, just say, Lord, I recognize my need of your free gift of salvation. I don't understand how it works, and it, it seems so uncomplicated. And I find it difficult to believe that by just asking you to come into my life to forgive my sins, to cleanse me and to heal me that I can begin a new life with you. Help my unbelief, Lord. And help me to begin this journey with you today for your glory and your kingdom's sake. Amen. Amen. As we come around the table of remembering what God did for us, these are symbols that remind us of the blood and the, of the, uh, uh, that our Lord shed and the body that took all the pain and the buffeting. If you love the Lord Jesus come, Christ, come and partake of the bread and wine. What we're going to do, we're going to, to sing a hymn. And as we sing the hymn, I'm going to ask those on my left to come and to take, keeping your, your distance, take the bread and the wine and to go back to your place. And once we've all taken the bread and the wine, then we will share it. So as soon as we begin to sing, can I ask those on my left to come first and then those on my right. So let's sing this hymn. Come this way and go back that way. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
the same night in which Jesus was betrayed, after giving thanks. Let's give thanks. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you were willing to come and to pay the price for our sins. The emblems here represents your body and your blood. We pray that as we take them, we will be reminded that you have paid the price for us. And that you have given us your spirit in exchange for our failings and our faults. And you have placed us within your family, the family of God. We thank you that you took our pain and our suffering. As the prophet says, by your stripes we are healed. You shed your life blood so that we might have life. It is in your Lord, your death, 
It is there that we find life. And so this afternoon as we partake of the bread and wine, we pray that you will draw us closer to you and closer to each other for your kingdom's sake. We are reminded that the same night in which Jesus was betrayed, after giving thanks, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body which is broken for you. As often as you do this, do so in remembrance of me. Let us take and eat bread in remembrance of our Lord's broken body. price he paid he did not owe. The debt we owe we could not pay. Thank you Lord. After supper Jesus took the final cup and he said this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for many. As often as we eat the bread and as often as we drink from the cup we are proclaiming our Lord's death until he comes or call. Let us drink together as a sign of our union. You gave us life and we bless your name. We pray that the life that is in us will flow out, that others might see you, Lord, and experience your grace and your love. We thank you that our healing is in you. We thank you that our hope is in you. And so we ask that during this season of preparing to celebrate your coming amongst us, and remembering that you are going to return, that we will offer the gift of salvation to those who know you not. That we will lead others to you so that you might minister to them. We pray now, Father, for all the body of Christ, for your healing touch upon our lives. Open our eyes to see you and our minds to understand you and encourage us to take steps of faith, Lord. Bring healing, Lord, where healing is needed. Comfort where comfort is needed. And strengthen us so we may walk together as one. As we are in his presence, please mention the names of those that are dear to you, that you know of who needs God's touch. Just mention their names. Thank you, Lord. We thank you that you know the needs of all these individuals whose names are mentioned. And we just ask that in your grace and your mercy, you will reach out to them and bless them for your glory and your kingdom's sake. Amen. As we sing our final hymn, we would normally be collecting an offering, but we, um, if you have brought your communion offering, just place it in the offering box as you leave. Let us stand together as we sing our final hymn before we leave. Rod, Ivan is going to sing it to us and, you know, just, just rest it. He knows my name. God knows your name. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Be encouraged that he knows your name. You are written in the palm of his hand. That means no weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. In Jesus' name. Stand together.
knows my name Thank you, Father, that you know our names individually. You know everything about us, and yet you love us with an everlasting love. 
As we go from this time of gathering, help us to keep that at the center of our being, that you know us and you are walking with us and you are holding our hands. Help us to trust you and to walk in confidence that our God is with us. Go with us then, we pray. And so may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, rest, remain, and abide with us all evermore. Amen. Go in peace. And in the knowledge that he will walk with you every step of the way. God bless you. He